1 Peter chapter 3 contains expressions and reveals doctrines that are so scintillating and so hopeful and motivating for covenant-keeping saints, and especially those who are being addressed in this epistle who we know were, were suffering so terribly under Roman rule. Some of these expressions, just as a teaser, are in verse 7 where it says, heirs together of the grace of life. There's much to say about that, and we will in just a moment. And how about in verse 12? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. This is a rough restatement of a verse in Psalm 33, and brings so much comfort and hope. It's, a, it's scriptural evidence that the eyes of the Lord are on us and are watching his righteous. Then we learn more as we get to verse 19 about this stunning doctrine that the Savior preached to the spirits in prison. Well, moving back then to the first section in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it spans from verses 1 to 7. This, uh, this expression in verse 7 that I read a moment ago is, is such a, an inspiring doctrine and also a very holy and sacred doctrine. Uh, it's easy for us with our modern sensibilities to get tripped up on a couple of words that we find uh, in verses 1 through 7, especially in verse 1 where we see uh, the word subjection and the idea that wives should be in subjection to their own husbands. Or then in verse 7, uh, the wife is described as the weaker vessel. So these phrases deserve some explanation uh, so that we don't get misdirected um, and, and that we don't read this in the wrong spirit because I believe what we find at the latter part of verse 7 is a very sacred doctrine that is related to exaltation itself. And it is that understanding of that doctrine and of the absolute uh, equality and equanimity between husband and wife and between male, male and female that is necessary for this state of exaltation that we come to understand that Peter could not have meant anything else or could not have understood anything else except the absolute equality of man and woman in the Lord. So, moving through this section with that understanding, let's look at verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, it says, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any, and it's nice to insert husbands here, if any husbands obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So that's the way that covenant wives speak around their non-believing or non-covenant husbands and can influence them to um, move into the covenant pathway with them. That seems to be the context that Peter is, um, is talking inside of here. This word subjection and, and its uh, prefix of sub is um, similar to words uh, such as subordinate or subjugation. And uh, to a modern reader suggests that one party is um, subordinate and that one party is superior. Well, as we, as we go on and read this, it, it becomes more clear. And again, we are informed by other scripture and other doctrines that make it perfectly clear that it is not the Lord's intention for one gender to be in subjugation to another, and there is no sense of, of subordinate and superior in the relationship between man and woman. This, um, another SUB word is submit or submission, and that's bringing us closer to the heart of this matter, I believe, which is that both male and female have the task, as King Benjamin expressed it in Mosiah 3.19, to overcome the tendencies of the natural man, or of course he could have said the natural person. Uh, and, and we become submissive 
to the Lord in the same way that a child submits to his father. And so it's really the task of both man and woman and both genders to, to move forward in selflessness and in humility and love. And it's, it's, that, um, it's that task that both genders have uh, in the way that they approach each other and in the way that they approach the Lord. And moving on uh, to verse 3, we learn about adornments and adorning. And I don't remember where it was that Paul used this same imagery, but he did. I think it may have been in 2 Corinthians, where he talked about how it's better to adorn your inner self than to adorn your outer self. And uh, he uses, uh, Peter uses in verse 4 the phrase, hidden man, hidden man of the heart. That's who we should adorn, and that's the person that is of, at the end of verse 4, great price to God. So these two verses read like this. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be hidden, uh, uh, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. If this language in verses 3 and 4 are too colored by the earlier impression of verse 1, that Peter is saying that uh, women should be subject to men, then uh, it, it can color the way that we read these verses. But if you can separate that out, and as I mentioned earlier, not get misdirected or sent in the wrong, uh, in, into the wrong spirit of reading this, you can see something very beautiful about this, that the way that we should adorn ourselves is with a meek and quiet spirit. It's nice to read that um, in connection with Mosiah 319, in fact, and I'd recommend that. But I want to look at a recent statement by Elder Bednar on what meekness is. This helps us a great deal in understanding the relationship between men and women, too. In teaching us about meekness in the April 2018 General Conference, Elder Bednar said, Meekness is a particular spiritual receptivity to learning both from the Holy Ghost and from people who may seem less capable, experienced, or educated, who may not hold important positions, or who otherwise may not appear to have much to contribute. Recall how Naaman, captain of the king's army in Syria, overcame his pride and meekly accepted the advice of his servants to obey Elisha the prophet and wash in the river Jordan seven times. Meekness is the principal protection from the prideful blindness that often arises from prominence, position, power, wealth, and adulation. I think this is getting very close to the way in which Peter meant meekness here. And as he talks about the relationship between husbands and wives, he is talking about this way in which we can be receptive to learning from the Lord through the Holy Ghost, but also being receptive to learning from one another. Um, there's a little bit of humor in that, too, when I think of my wife uh, ever learning uh, from me uh, because I consider her my spiritual superior in every way. But I suppose that in the spirit of meekness, there may have been times that she could have learned something from me. Now we read about the example of Sarah and Abraham uh, in verse 6. Excuse me, verse 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters are ye as long as ye do dwell and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together for the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Again, the doctrine here is so holy and beautiful, and we're going to move into that now, that um, if... Our understanding of these seven verses can be colored by our understanding of that doctrine, then I think we have the right idea. Instead of allowing our understanding of this doctrine to be colored 
by a few of these uh, terms that offend our modern sensibilities uh, because it's very clear in our understanding of priesthood and in our understanding of this doctrine of exaltation that there is no inequality between the man and the woman. They truly are not without each other in the Lord, as Paul said. So perhaps weaker vessel in verse 7 simply has to do with um, perhaps frame or stature, but certainly has nothing to do with uh, worthiness or spiritual aptitude or spiritual standing before God. So this, uh, the, the key to this then I think is this phrase, heirs together, in verse 7. The concept of being an heir is expressed in other parts of the New Testament. It is a very holy uh, concept. Uh, the idea that we could be joint heirs with the chief heir, who is Jesus Christ, is another way of expressing the concept of exaltation. It implies everything that is expressed in the oath and covenant of the priesthood when it says that those who are exalted and we can take that to mean man and woman, are given all that the Father hath. Now this phrase together brings new understanding. And I think it's fair to say that really any notion that the Lord, uh, his priesthood pathway, or his church has a view of woman as inferior in any way is not fully informed by his gospel. And that's what I would say. And um, th this can only happen if we're kind of caught in a cultural translation of a holy concept. Um, because if you really think about what it means when the Lord um, says that um, it is not good for man to be alone. Or when he talks about uh, Adam's rib being the, the connection between Adam and Eve. Something sacred is happening here because God is telling you something about his own nature. And this is a sacred concept that I won't belabor because pondering upon it alone can reveal the truth of what I'm saying, I think. But suffice it to say that man is not without the woman in the Lord, and neither is woman without the man in the Lord, and that an exalted being into the highest degree of the celestial kingdom would be an exalted composite being. It would be male and female together as equals. This is... Uh, well understood by the prophets that have taught this concept, but they've had different ways of expressing it, and again, much of it comes from earlier dispensations and translations from ancient expressions and ancient texts, but it's clear that that is the meaning. And so this beautiful phrase, heirs together of the grace of life, is something worth thinking deeply about. I want to end this section with a statement by President M. Russell Ballard, where he teaches us something about priesthood. Quote, in our priesthood, excuse me, in our Heavenly Father's great priesthood endowed plan, men have the unique responsibility to administer the priesthood, but they are not the priesthood. Men and women have different but equally valued roles. Just as a woman cannot conceive a child without a man, so a man cannot fully exercise the power of the priesthood to establish an eternal family without a woman. In other words, in the eternal perspective, both the procreative power and the priesthood power are shared by husband and wife. That is from an April conference in 2013. We're going to move into a new section in this chapter now that... Um, speaks more directly of the suffering of these saints. And uh, th there seems to be an underlying message in these verses, especially around uh, 8 through 12, that says it's not just about your persecutors desisting 
and there's something there's something to that because when when we suffer we would think that that's that's what needs to stop but peter seems to be teaching us that there's something that needs to start during this period of suffering and that's about us becoming something that's what he's focusing on as he counsels these suffering saints he says in verse 8 finally be ye all of one mind having compassion one of another love as brethren be pitiful be courteous not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing but contrariwise blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing here is peter's restatement of teachings that he would have heard from the person from the lips of jesus of nazareth nazareth himself on a variety of occasions he certainly would have heard the savior saying these things then verse 10 gives us something like a formula uh, for he that will love life and see good days so that's a comforting idea for those of us who are suffering if we would like to see good days then here's a formula let us one refrain his tongue from evil and two his lips that they speak no guile and those are related concepts of course and james talks a lot about that and verse 11 let him three eschew evil eschew means to to have nothing to do with to forsake to 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 be it's almost like evil would be an abhorrent anything that you eschew is, is abhorrent to you and four to do good let him five seek peace and ensue it or, or pursue it would be another way to put that so to seek or to pursue peace then we get this in verse 12 uh, it's so beautiful for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers then the opposite is stated after that but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil that sounds very proverbial if you will but it actually is as I mentioned earlier a rough restatement of uh, let me make sure I have this right of Psalm 33 verse 18 which says behold the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy what a hopeful expression verse 13 and who is he that will harm you if he be followers of that which is good yeah Peter understood this so well he, he was so courageous uh, who is he that will harm you because he's saying this in the face of intense persecution and people that can cause you immediate physical harm what a perspective he had then in verse 14 he actually uses the word terror he says but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled well then verse 15 but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and and I could have uh, mentioned this as one of the most uh, beautiful statements that are that are brought forward in this chapter and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear the uh, Greek word here that that is um, rendered as answer uh, is apologia and so you could also use the word defense the idea of apologetics of, of Christian apologetics is to to give an, uh, an explanation or a defense or a case for Christianity and so Peter is saying be ready to make a case for the gospel of Jesus Christ which would be the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear this is something that we can only do fully if the word is in us and this is true in two ways the word has to be in us mentally so that we can mount a defense or create a case however the word also has to be in us to the degree that we are filled with charity for those to whom we address because if we don't have that love and that deep respect for others as children of God 
then when we do make a case for the hope that is within us, it won't be received well. So two things, and that's something really worth thinking about. I want to read something about it uh, that Elder Maxwell wrote about um, defending the truth and making a case for the hope that is within us. And he quotes um, someone else inside of this. It's really worth thinking about. By the way, uh, I have to say that C.S. Lewis is, is often thought of as a great Christian apologist, and uh, uh, his writings are, are something that have informed my own understanding of, uh, of Christian doctrine um, as much as anything outside of canonized scripture. Elder Maxwell says, Articulate advocacy is surely needed now to respond to some of the secular sophistry we see and hear in the world. Austin Farrar warned, Though argument does not create conviction, the lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Peter said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And there's that, that meekness again. Then President Russell M. Nelson said something that I, I want to emphasize for just a moment. He said, each member can be an example of the believers. Your good works will be evident to others. The light of the Lord can beam from your eyes. With that radiance, you had better prepare for questions. <laughs> if, if you have had the privilege of meeting President Nelson one-on-one -on -one and looking into his eyes, I think it even comes through in photos. There's something so striking about his eyes that there, this seems to be a, uh, some, that there seems to be a degree of self-understanding here. <laughs> As President Nelson says that, uh, because it, it is an absolutely striking personal characteristic of President Russell M. Nelson that the light of the Lord does beam from his eyes to the degree that you had better prepare for questions, as he says, and I, I suspect he gets those questions. And I also suspect, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the Word is in him so thoroughly that he can explain the hope that is in him. He can make a case for the gospel and he has such a depth of love and feeling for those that he's addressing that um, he is doing fully what Peter is suggesting we do in verse 15. We go back to talking about persecution more generally in verses 16 through 18 before being introduced to this stunning doctrine. And it has a similar spirit really to 2 Corinthians uh, or excuse me, First Peter chapter two verse twelve, where he talks a little bit about about these these antagonists. Uh, so it reads like this, verse sixteen: Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, that they may be ashamed that falsely falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well doing than for evil doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins for the just uh, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. I want to look at this phrase for just a moment, the just for the unjust. What an idea that the most just, the Savior of the world, suffered in Gethsemane and on the cross. And I don't mean to to um, to limit his suffering to those times. Um, there's a lot I don't think we understand about um, about this. But his atonement for us is an act of the perfectly just standing in the stead of the unjust and receiving the estrangement from God and the the great burden of guilt that would come from being unjust. Somehow he shouldered that, and Peter is expressing an understanding of that in this verse, and that, that's um, a, uh, a thought trail uh, of, of glorious doctrine that we could follow for quite a, 
a while here by using the scriptures in the Book of Mormon, but uh, clearly Peter understood this. Then we come to this concept in verse 19. It says, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was preparing, or the JST says, uh, while the long suffering of God waited, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So why are we talking about these souls being saved and, uh, and about, about Noah, uh, these eight souls? Well, it, it's telling us that there were so many spirits who were imprisoned after their sojourn in mortality because of their disobedience. However, they still deserved to be preached to. And this is the point that uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, not Joseph F. Smith, who had the great vision of the redemption of the dead that was triggered by this phrase in, in Peter and in other uh, writings of Peter's, but Joseph Fielding Smith, and he says the following, In the justice of the Father, he is going to give every man the privilege of hearing the gospel. Not one soul shall be overlooked or forgotten. This being true, what about the countless thousands who have died and never heard of Christ, never had an opportunity of repentance and remission of their sins? And, and, and that's what Peter's doing when talking about all these people that weren't the eight that were saved by the ark. He's saying the same thing. And then says Joseph Fielding Smith, never met an elder of the church holding the authority. Well, the Lord has so arranged his plan of redemption that all who have died without this opportunity shall be given it in the spirit world. All those who did not have an opportunity here to receive it, who there repent and receive the gospel, shall be heirs of the celestial kingdom of God. The Savior inaugurated this great work when he went and preached to the spirits held in prison, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, or in other words, according to the principles of the gospel, and then live according to God in the spirit through their repentance and acceptance of the mission of Jesus Christ who died for them. And then of course we can read that uh, section in the Doctrine and Covenants section 138. Elder Ballard speaks so eloquently about this section and it gives us incredible insight into the state of mind and heart and spirit that Joseph F. Smith would have been in right around the time of, of World War I and around a time when he had lost so many of his own family. And then Elder Ballard talks about how he lost his own dear wife recently and then gives this stunning and incredible talk about this, this doctrine. Well, here's a teaching by Lorenzo Snow that deserves to be read, and it almost runs counter, but I don't think it does. I think it still accounts for it, but it almost runs counter to the teaching in the Book of Mormon that says that we'll p be possessed with the same spirit in this life then the, uh, as, as we'll have in the next life. We'll be possessed of the same spirit. And, uh, and then he talks about a night of darkness wherein no labor can be performed. So this is the time for men to prepare to meet God. For behold, this is the day uh, for, for us to perform our labors. Well, I, I sh shouldn't say that this runs counter. But when we have this image of us dying and this, this idea that our probation has ended and that our opportunity to hear the word and to, to be affected by it and to change has passed. It's not quite true. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that there's a contradiction between Lorenzo Snow and Alma, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'm saying that Alma understood this fully as well and that, that both statements are, are true. But do listen to this. This is Lorenzo Snow. He says, When the gospel is preached to the spirits in prison, the success attending that preaching will be far greater than that attending the preaching of our elders in this life. I believe there will be very few indeed of those spirits who will not gladly receive the gospel when it is carried to them. The circumstances there will be a thousand times more favorable. What a statement. Now the last two verses of this chapter read like this. Verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subjective, subject, subject unto him. I love the symmetry of this chapter and the way that this works. It ends with an acknowledgement of the Savior Jesus Christ, the true way. What a joy, what a privilege to be made subject to him. And at the beginning of this chapter, we talked a great deal about subjugation and subject and submissiveness and subordinate, these S-U-B words. And here it comes at the end of the chapter, the same word subject once again, made subject unto Jesus Christ. That is a subjection that we all happily submit ourselves to. There is no hint of oppression or unrighteous dominion in him. There's no shadow of changing, no variableness. He is pure mercy. As the hymn, uh, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling says, Jesus, thou art pure compassion. I think it's all. Jesus, thou art all compassion. Pure, unbounded love thou art.